instead of living in the trauma and building the, the myelin sheaths, because we know that the myelin sheaths, right, grow and that increases whatever it is that it's growing on. So if it's growing on trauma, it's going to increase the myelin sheath and the trauma is gonna be accentuated. Whereas if you uh, grow it on the healthy side, the healing aspect, the myelin sheath grows on the healthy neural pathways. And we can just go in really deep, very intense, feel the pain, get underneath it, get to the power that's underneath that holds that and just blows it out of the water really. And then moves us into actually a place of transcendent aliveness. It's above and beyond anything that they have experienced in their life. I think any healing journey does include development, but they don't necessarily need to understand that it does. So for example, a lot of people uh, might develop into first person perspective to second person perspective to third person perspective and have no awareness that they're on a developmental journey. And they might be very happy there and never need to study development or understand they're on a developmental journey or anything like that. They could be very happy just where they're at. So a few minutes ago, you said that when we engage in the healing process, there is a developmental dimension inside it, what you're describing now is suggesting also that when you engage in the developmental process, there is a healing cycle that will appear through that process. You cannot develop without healing and retracing the various trauma experiences or whatever you, you've accumulated on your journey. That's right. And that's where fourth person perspective peoples get really interested in shadow work and psychotherapy and healing. The portals of perception inquiry centers on how we humans grow and evolve. We are seeking to appreciate the struggle and the promise inside the shift underway. Naturally, mental health, psychological maturation, and the whole person development are central to these inquiries. Kim Barta is an internationally recognized psychotherapist, coach, spiritual guide and speaker. His work is founded in an experiential practice with different cultures and challenges. Together with his sister Terry O'Fallon, Kim leads the Stages International Endeavor and its mission to create cultures and systems that mirror a healthy interconnected web of all life, of individuals, communities, and the planet and beyond. Kim, it's great to have you here on this portal's discovery adventure. Thank you, Aviv, for having me with you today. So there is much we want to explore today. Let me begin by asking simply, what would you add to your current areas of interest and focus and work? Uh, there's so many exciting things to work on that I can barely keep up with it all. That's the thing. Uh, right now, I have a trilogy uh, work, um, a book. I have a trilogy book coming out on shadow. It's going to be illuminating shadow, healing shadow, and organizational shadow. Uh, currently, I'm doing research on relationship, uh, developmental perspectives on relationship, and the statistics have come out really good on it. So I'll be writing a book on that soon. And uh, I have a parenting book that's in the editing stage. And I'm launching a website that's working on um, moving people through shadow. And so the website is based upon three basic courses, illuminating shadow, healing shadow, and communing with shadow. So the first is a very inexpensive introductory uh, course that just helps people identify it. Uh, identify their shadow. And then the second one is a little bit on healing shadow. And the third one is a deep dive, long, deep dive, year long experiential uh, practice within community um, uh, online, though, in community on uh, healing shadow and putting this into real life practice in your life. So, really, the full space, deep shadow work and parenting 
and relationship. What, what's the trigger? I'm curious um, for the the new book you're working on for relationship. Uh, how is that placed inside the cosmology of everything else you're working on? Well, Terry and I founded Stages International, which you outlined in the introduction here. And part of that is we research different um, aspects of human development. So we might research, um, uh, um, we have parenting um, research on how parents uh, develop through the spectrum to parent in different ways, how uh, relationships in this case, um, how people view relationships through the developmental spectrum, how people view climate change through the developmental spectrum. And we have, uh, I don't know, 15 different topics or something like that, eight or 10, I can't remember how many. We have several in the works and several that are completed. And uh, we have multiple projects, in other words, that are based upon helping us understand different world, real life experiences that people have through the developmental spectrum. In other words, decoding how people experience and how they behave differentially along those different stages of development. Yes. In all, potentially in all the core domains of life, uh, parenting and relationship uh, are front and center in, in, in that, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so there is um, much there to explore. I'm, I'm curious, still at this early stage in the conversation, to ask you of all the things you do as a psychotherapist, as a healer, as a, as a coach, what do you find most challenging? And where do you find the, the most joy? Interestingly, what I find the most challenging is working with people that are steeped in psychotherapy because they have this belief system that it has to take a long time. They have this belief system that you can't change rapidly. If I get people that are not too steeped in, in modern psychotherapy, I can get incredibly rapid change. And that's really fun and exciting. So a lot of times what I have to do is work at undoing faulty beliefs that it takes a long time to get that uh, to move a little faster and a little more freely. I just love working with anybody, really. I love working throughout the entire developmental spectrum. I have worked with uh, babies, really, even, you know, even though you're not working exactly with the baby, you're working with the parent and the baby, all the way up to... Um, 80 year old, 90 year olds, even. I love working with people of multiple cultures. I did a lot of work on the Native American reservation and worked with incredible traumatic, multi generational traumatic abuse there. Uh, I still am here. I work with incredibly wealthy, privileged families. I, I just love working with everybody, actually. I don't have a, a particular um, place that I don't like working, actually. Um, the main thing is working with people that have rigid belief systems about what can and can't happen. Um, and that just makes it harder and a little tedious. So that's what I prefer not to do. What differentiates and what enables what you're describing as rapid healing, rapid processing through whatever it is that you are journeying on with somebody you're working with? Well, like, for example, usually when we talk about PTSD, people in psychotherapy are talking about six months, two years, eight years, you know, different lengths of period of time to deal with PTSD. But it's not uncommon for me to work through PTSD with somebody in a single session, for example. Wow. And yeah. Yeah. It's, it's actually pretty routine at this point. You know, the first session is usually the healing. And then I have usually have three to maybe 10 follow-up sessions just to make sure that it holds things. I've had people that have been, for example, a woman who was sexually molested by her boyfriend. She came in, uh, she was healed in one session. She came back for five more sessions to make sure it's good. She, she told me, um, you know what? I don't have time for psychotherapy. My life is so good. I'm so glad that I was raped because I would have never met you and I'd never have the life that I have now. And when we say now one session, one session, when you, when you say she was healed in one session, you, we mean what you mean, what by that, the, the traumatic experience has been metabolized, transmogrified and, and the brain has, has been able to reroute 
the, w whatever is associated with the experience. That that's my interpretation. But ground me in, in what does that mean that a person can be healed in one session? It means she went from experience of of trauma and living in the trauma to a place of. I'm not sure if I want to say this word, but ecstasy, really. This is really common for me. I move people from a place of trauma to a place of ecstasy or uh, aliveness, or what some people would say spiritual awakening uh, in one session very commonly. And, and what happens is that rewrites, reroutes the neural pathways. So instead of living in the trauma and building this, the myelin sheaths, because we know that the myelin sheaths, right, grow and that increases whatever it is that it's growing on. So if it's growing on trauma, it's going to increase the myelin sheath and the trauma is going to be accentuated. Whereas if you uh, grow it on the healthy side, the healing aspect, the myelin sheath grows on the healthy neural pathways. And so one of the problems with modern psychotherapy is we spend a lot of time rehashing the trauma. And what we're actually doing is building the myelin sheath and actually making the trauma worse in a lot of cases. So if you really understand neurobiology and you understand um, uh, various other techniques that have been used around the world, um, you can actually transport the mind from following the traumatic neural pathway to a healthy neural pathway, and you can accentuate the healthy um, neuropeptides in the brain. And once those neuropeptides get activated through psychotherapy, through a healthy psychotherapy, um, the person's uh, natural tendency is to follow the healthy neural pathway instead of the traumatic one. Can you uh, say and, and describe a little what, what is it that you do in, in a one session like this that, that enables you to catalyze such a dramatic shift? Well, that that's the that's part of the work that I'm doing. It takes a lot more than a, than a quick uh, session to, or, you know, an hour to describe what I'm doing. But basically what we do is we do go into the trauma. I think you do have to go into the trauma. Otherwise you're just doing bypass, but we don't linger there. And I think that's the key piece. I think a lot of times in psychotherapy, we think we need to linger there to metabolize it. We don't, we need to go there. Actually what happens is the people go in there acutely and intently and deeply so that the pain is actually more severe, but for a very short period of time. And, and then we get underneath it and we heal it. And then that brings us up to the neural pathway. So a lot of people would might think, oh, Kim's just avoiding it. He's just moving them, doing kind of like a spiritual bypass thing. It's absolutely the opposite. Instead of, instead of taking this uh, piecemeal approach where you kind of feel the pain a little bit, but you want to be really sensitive to how much the person can handle, and then a little bit more and sensitive to how much they can handle. I mean, that's really sweet. And sometimes you have to take the long approach. I'm not saying you can't. There's probably 30% of my clients, I have to take that long approach because they just don't have the skills or the, the coping capacities to handle it. But actually 70, about 75% do, 70 to 75% do have these capacities. And we can just go in really deep, very intense, feel the pain, get underneath it, get to the power that's underneath that holds that and just blows it out of the water really. And then moves us into actually a place of transcendent aliveness. It's above and beyond anything that they have experienced in their life. Wow. Is it true that a prerequisite is they want to be healed? They want to find remedy. That, that is a necessary condition. It's, that's a necessary condition. They have to want to, which I trust most people do. Um, they have to want to, and they have to not be bought into the belief, the old psychotherapy belief system that it takes a long time. Wow. So still staying a little bit with um, the journey, describe a little the, the journey that brought you to do this work uh, today and, and f where, where you're able to create these kind of impacts and, and results for people. How did you end up doing this inside the broader context of uh, the developmental work? Uh, give a bit of a high level storyline, please. Okay. Um, well, when I graduated with my degree, 
actually my undergrad degree is in cultural anthropology. My graduate degree is a, is a, actually it's a really nice program. It's, it's gone now. You can't even get into it anymore. It, it was a combination of, of psychology, counseling, social work, and sociology. And then my background was in cultural anthropology. So I got this really nice, diverse perspective uh, in my training about how to do work. And then, um, and then I, I, I lived with a Native American shaman for uh, about six months. And that was an interesting experience to get that cultural perspective. And then later I graduated and I worked with um, the severely mentally ill for a while. And then when I got into my private practice, I started on the Native American reservation where the trauma was huge. And there, I was basically the only full-time psychotherapist there. Um, there were two other people that had been there for a while. They had only lived, they had only worked there for, they only worked about a half a day or one day a week. And they said that there just wasn't enough business on the reservation. I'm going, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> So I, I mean, I went there and, and there was so, I mean, I was full in six months and it, it was so filled. There was so much trauma. Um, and, and, and I was using these, these modern psychotherapeutic techniques, but they take a long time. And I'm going, there's no way I can do everything I need to do. If I just stick with these, these, these techniques, I mean, it, there's too much work to be done here. And so I started exploring and researching. And, and so I, I explored the confluence between shamanism, neurobiology, modern psychotherapy. And I started looking at things through different lenses. And, and, I, and the confluence between those three led me to um, this work that I do, which I call Shadow to Spirit, which I don't mean to have a religious connotation to it at all. It just means it moves people from a place of trauma to a place of, of, of wonder and, and aliveness in the world, however you want to look at that. But, but it's, it's very neuro, neurobiologically based. And so what I did was I just started going, well, what are the shamanic elements around the world that are consistent around the world? What are the neurobiological research and what seems to be working in modern psychotherapy? And that confluence between those three led me to this practice. And I refined it and about, I started developing it about almost 30 years ago now. And I refined it and got it down really good about 25 years ago. And, and it's, it's pretty much second nature to me. And I've continued to refine it through the years so that I'm even more efficient in more broad cases. At first, I, I was only successful maybe 30% of the time. And I've got it up to about 75% of the time, 75% of different individuals and different types of experiences. So what were the shamanic elements that um, you found were consistent throughout all traditions all around the world that offered some perennial wisdom that needed to be integrated into uh, modern uh, therapy approaches? One of the things that, that um, shamans do very good is the skillful use of, of symbolism of the conscious, unconscious, pre-conscious mind. And so what they'll do is they'll take the symbolic elements and they, you know, like it's like, um, if you take a look at like even Jungian or, or um, Freudian dream work, it, it's kind of rigid and structured compared to shamanism. Shaman is a very dynamic and fluid and, and, custom created use of, of uh, symbolism to, uh, to orient the mind in a new way. And so it's not like, oh, just do this practice to create this outcome. It's a very creative practice. It's a co-creative practice between the individual and the client. And you really listen to the symbolic elements of the client. And then you understand how those symbolic elements are leading to uh, disharmony or dishealth. And then you rearrange or introduce new symbolic elements to take those elements and shift them, just turn them into positive health. So instead of fighting everything, you use the power, but you just turn the power towards positive health. And I hear between the lines that part of the approach is you allow yourself to engage your intuitive, creative, 
connective uh, capabilities, capacities on, on point rather than follow a certain rigid association of, of what belongs with, with, with what. So you become in a way a, a living uh, embodied uh, conduit of intelligence inside the process with, with the client, with the patient, um, based on the, the trust that you, you're able to cultivate with that person. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You're right on. Yeah. Beautiful. So you've been able to, to pull these traditions together with the, the cutting edge of science and with the, the con- continually evolving space of, of therapy. And it, for some reason, shadow became a very important part of that. And how did that come about? Why was the shadow work so central in the uh, confluence of, of those different modalities? Yeah, well, I'm using shadow work probably in a broad sense of the term. Um, and, and I think it was originally meant that way too. Uh, shadow being any aspect of the unconscious mind. And so maybe in, in the way a lot of people use shadow, the term shadow now, it might not be appropriate to use it. But I'm just talking about the entire power of the entire unconscious mind, as well as the conscious mind, and bringing the power of those two together. And so that's, that's one of the powerful things that shamans have, is they already know how to, how to tap into the power of the unconscious mind to enact healing uh, for the conscious mind. And a lot of times, um, traditional shadow work is almost the opposite. It's like, how do you... How do you uncover the unconscious mind so that you can heal the, un- the conscious mind? And, and both are very valuable and, and good, by the way. I'm not saying one's better than the other. Can you, clar- can you clarify of- again the distinction between the, the, the two approaches? Okay, so for shadow work, if you're doing shadow work, what you're doing is you are uh, illuminating the unknown mind, the, the unconscious mind, getting wisdom from that and then bringing it up. And shamans take the symbolism that's arising from the unconscious mind, and instead of necessarily having to illuminate more, they use the power of the symbols themselves to and to bring up the power of the unconscious mind to enact healing without necessarily having to go into insight-oriented psychotherapy. And that's why you get the, that increased velocity because you're dealing with the, with the coded power. And, and, and you access through those coded pathways the, the, the potential of it, the, the energetic potential of it without having to process the entire material that's associated with it. Exactly. Beautiful. You got it. Very few people get that that fast. You're right on it. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. So you already have the neural pathways developed as the point is. The myelin sheaths, they're already there. There's just a couple elements that are off. And so if you can understand the symbolic disturbance there, then you just basically um, surgically remove, psychosurgically remove the disturbing element and put in a new uh, symbolic element that's going to steer it in the right direction. And boom, they're off and running. And those pathways, and those pathways then enable you to heal the the, the conscious mind, the, the, yeah. the known part of the mind. And am I correct that to do to to guide this process, this is not something you quote unquote can do on another person. You you are facilitating, co-creating, choreographing, enabling, midwifing, all of the above and more. They have to become conscious agents in their own healing. Am I describing that correctly? Yeah, yeah, uh, very very correctly. Um, sometimes, like if I'm working with very very uh, early developmental, like teenage children or young children, you know, we're definitely co-creating it, but they have no clue what's going on, right? <laughs> so you can do this with, with any developmental age, pretty much, as long as they're, you know, maybe not babies and stuff, you know, they're not linguistic, you know, that's when you use the parent-child interaction. But yeah, they don't necessarily have to know the dynamics that are going on. People don't have to know that, but they are still part of the process. So they don't need. So they don't need to consciously track the the meaning making transformative process. They need to become participant in the dialogic 
discovery and that in itself becomes the rerouting mechanism for their process. Yes, the, not just the logic though, the psychosomatic, sensorial, systemic process. Right, so it's, it's, it's a throughout all system embodied felt experience. A whole systemic approach, yes. Wow. Well, so, so this is great. This is really grounding us in, in that side of the work and, and offer a bridging comment from that part of your life and work to the developmental and the stages part of the work and, and how the two are connected. Wonderful. So one of the things that, that just about, I, I assume everybody's trained in when they do psychotherapy is they're trained in some developmental uh, psychology a little bit. Um, and so I was using Eric Erickson's uh, psychosocial developmental model. And then uh, my sister Terry came in and she was developing the stages model. And when I saw that, the whole world just opened up like, oh my gosh, that's like huge improvement. And so I took her model and then some of my models that I had developed in terms of learning theory, and we combined them together to create the stages model. Terry, Terry, I, Terry, I want to say created the stages model. I, I just added a few enhanced uh, criteria to them to make it a little bit, I think a little bit better. So, but the, the big award goes to Terry for developing it. And then, uh, and then utilizing that in, in addition to the understanding of the shadow, the shamanism, the neuroplasticity, and that has made things even more efficient and more effective. So that's been wonderful to uh, add to the, the mix of healing modalities. And, and by way of grounding the, the bridging, is, is the following, will the following statement be correct or too simplistic, that, which is that any healing journey sooner or later must lead to a developmental journey because the two are inseparable. Is this too simplistic or how would you rephrase what I, what I was trying to, to get to there? Yeah, I think any healing journey does include development, but they don't necessarily need to understand that it does. So for example, a lot of people uh, might develop into first person perspective to second person perspective to third person perspective and have no awareness that they're on a developmental journey. And they might be very happy there and never need to study development or understand they're on a developmental journey or anything like that. They could be very happy just where they're at. Um, as soon as we put people get to fourth, later fourth person perspective, they really see the developmental journey and, and they know they're on it and they really want to be on it. But, um, so, but people can live very happy lives um, at any developmental level and not realize or see that they're on a developmental um, project. That's, that's fascinating. You, you do not have to have the map to access, at least not second and third person perspective. You, you do not have to, to have the, the cognitive map of what it is you're actually doing in your processing if you have the, the, the experiential and the behavioral um, pathways to, to engage in, in those capacities. Yeah, in fact, I think it can go well beyond. I think it could go first, second, third, fourth easily without knowing that you're in that journey. It's just that in late fourth person perspective, that's when you tend to see it. For the people that just lost us in, in this dialogue here, how would you define simply first, second, third, and fourth uh, person perspective so we, we get it grounded in, in, in the real experiential sense? All right, let's go on a developmental journey, shall we? <laughs> Please. Okay. We are born into the world as babies. We're in first person perspective. And that first person perspective is, is just receiving the world. It's all just coming in the sights, the sounds, the touch, the taste, the smell, the movements, and it's all just coming into us and we're just absorbing it. That's the receptive stage, receptive first person perspective. Now, Big thing happens when we get to around a year old, six months it starts happening because kids start crawling. They start crawling on their own. They start getting active. When they get to be around one, they're even more active. And you'll notice the difference because parents that have one to four-year-olds have 
chaotic houses. It's almost impossible to keep the house clean. Kids are running all over the place and um, they're, they're, they're just getting into everything. So this is still first person perspective though. It's still all about me and it's, but it's active. It's about what I want, right? And what I can do on my own. So first person perspective is all about me. I only see through my own eyes and you can start noticing when second person perspective comes in because uh, a kid might be standing naked on the table, dancing and singing. And then the next moment, all of a sudden hiding behind their parents' legs or backs. Um, and what's their hap what they're noticing is they suddenly get shy. And parents often get confused by this because, gosh, two weeks ago, they weren't shy about anything. Now they're shy all the time. What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. They just got into second person perspective. And what's happening is they see that other people see them. Before that, they just thought that they were seeing the world and they were just putting it out there. But all of a sudden they, they see that others can see them. And you can see this too, because children will hide in first person perspective. Children might hide in the middle of a room and close their eyes. You can't see me, you know, and you'll say, yes, I can. And they'll say, no, you can. We'll say, yes, you can. We'll say, yes, you can. And yes, I can. And they'll actually get mad and argue with you. You can't either. You can't see me. And, and, Parents often think that the kids are just playing, but they're actually very serious. They really believe they're hiding. In second person perspective, you can actually hide. You go hide somewhere where people can't see you. So you can see that difference in second person perspective. But the most important difference in second person perspective is we go, we see the world of friendship. In first person perspective, we're in parallel play. If we see a toy in somebody else's hand, we'll grab it out of their hand. If they resist, we might hit them over the head and take it. And we don't mean to be mean. We're not anti-moral. We're pre-moral. We just don't have moral understanding yet. And the reason is we don't have theory of mind. Theory of mind comes on around fourth person perspective. It kind of grows into it, but um, around fourth person perspective. And what happens in theory of mind is we see, oh, you have a mind just like I have a mind. You can see me like I can see you and you know things that I don't know. And all of a sudden now, the world of friendship opens up to them. They never saw the world of friendship before. Now they see what pro-social friendship really is. And so in second person perspective, we will give the toy to have the friend. We will share the toy to have a friend. And so that, that brings us into second person perspective. And in second person perspective, we learn all these kindergarten rules like sharing and fairness and all of that. And then we institutionalize them a little more in later second person perspective where we have moral codes of conduct to live by. And these moral codes of conduct don't need to, need to be religious. They can be um, like, think about the, the, the groupings that we get in, in high school where you got the jocks and the brains and the nerds and the all, you know, everybody has to live kind of by their own code of conduct. And that's what happens in, in later second person perspective. And then in third person perspective, we start, we, our consciousness looks out and looks in at uh, our, our codes of conduct and says, wait a minute, does that really work for me? I mean, I grew up in it, whether it was a religious one or a, a secular one, it doesn't matter, but I grew up in it, but is that really me? And so now I start taking a third a, a, a objective perspective on it where we talk about logic, but the logic is turned towards ourselves, not towards you know some inanimate object. So this is where I become aware of my awareness, conscious of my consciousness, and this is where a, a different freedom of choice begins to appear in my process? Yeah, I can, I can look in. So now I have, have this logical ability to take a logical perspective on myself. And, how, and what happens in the transition from, from third to fourth? How is that journey? Okay, that's a beautiful one. So in late third person perspective, we start, we actually start thinking about our thinking itself. So uh, at early third person perspective, we're thinking about what we were trained to be like and going, wait a minute, I want to take the mask off. But in late third person perspective, we start thinking about our thought process itself and go, is this thought process even accurate? Is the way that I'm even thinking working? And then the next step from there is 
I step out into awareness of my thinking of my thinking, and I become aware of my thinking and thinking processes. And then I'm more in a place of awareness. So what happens here in this place of awareness is I'm a, I start going, wait a minute, all of my thinking was shaped by the way I was raised, by the way culture shaped me, by the way my peers shaped me, by everything. And no matter how much I think about my thinking, it's still trapped within that cultural, the broader culture and the mini culture dynamics. So I step out and I want to see a bigger view of this. I want to step outside of the culture dynamic of that, that even shaped the way that I think. And then I saw that brings us into awareness or kind of an open mind that isn't polluted with a lot of thinking yet. So I can have kind of a little more space from it. And so I start exploring a, a broader. So what happens at this point then is what I really will get interested in is I want to have honest, accurate feedback from you, Aviv. Will you give me some honest, accurate feedback? Before that, you know, people say, well, I'll take some feedback, but I'm not <laughs> sure I want it. <laughs> right? I'll take it kind of like as a bitter pill that I have to go through. But in fourth person perspective, it's like, what do you see in me? I want to really understand myself better. And I know I can't see myself because I'm locked in my own cultural dynamic. What do you see? And that brings us to these really deep evolving conversations where we get to our deeper authentic self. So a few minutes ago, you said that when we engage in the healing process, there is a developmental dimension inside it. What you are describing now is suggesting also that when you engage in the developmental process, there is a healing cycle that will appear through that process. You cannot develop without healing and retracing the various trauma experiences or whatever you, you've accumulated on your journey. That's right. And that's where fourth person perspective peoples get really interested in shadow work and psychotherapy and healing. People can get interested in psychotherapy and third person perspective too. And there's a lot of psychotherapeutic techniques in third person perspective, like cognitive restructuring. Oh, I have this thought. Let's just change it to that thought. But that's pretty unfulfilling for a fourth person perspective. They want to have a, a little more depth and, and richness in their uh, experience than that. And they want to understand how culture shaped their mind. And so um, we get into more of the uh, more advanced methods of, of psychology. So you use the term and we, we talked about trauma just to ground us. What is trauma? How do you define trauma? S some people define trauma as a, as a form of memory. What, what's your definition of trauma? Well, yeah. I mean, if you had no memory, you, I would, I, I, this is a hard, this is a difficult thing. Okay, if I had no memory, sure, I wouldn't have no trauma, but I wouldn't have any life either, right? And, and so if you take a look at people that have no memory, they're traumatized all the time because they, they don't understand what's happening in life, right? So if you take, you know, people with severe Alzheimer's, like I, I took care of my mother-in-law, uh, my wife and my, my wife and I took care of my mother-in-law till she had a memory that was only like down to 30 seconds. Okay. Hmm. And she was still doing pretty good. She was still pretty happy because we were very loving, very supportive, very caring, and, and it, it all worked out fine. But uh, there's so many people with Alzheimer's disease that when their, their memories drop down below five minutes or three minutes or 30 seconds, everything's strange to them and they're frightened all the time. And that's trauma too. So I think that it's accurate to say trauma is memory, but not all trauma necessarily has to be memory. Um, so I think we need to think of it in a little bit bigger frame. But in terms of doing most psychotherapeutic work, what we really are looking at is, oh, there was a trauma experience and a neural pathway got developed. And now they're going down that same neural pathway over and over and over again. That would be the neurobiological explanation. Now you can call that memory if you want, but this is more a specific way to describe it, right? Memory is just simply a neural pathway that has a thick myelin sheath that the neural, the neural, the neural signals, electro neural signals, the neurochemical signals travel very quickly along. And so um, it's true that it takes a long time to wean those off, except that if you do neuropsychosurgery, 
uh, the neural pathway is severed and it goes down a new neural pathway. And then that neural neural pathway doesn't have to be just a little bit better. It can be exactly, absolutely ecstatic and beautiful. So that's what I do instead of, instead of taking that neural pathway and just going, we're going to shift it a little bit here. So it's a little bit better and then shift it here. So it's a little bit better. Why design all those neural pathways, design the most beautiful pathway you can possibly create and then sever the old one and create the new one. And then the job is to get the client to practice the new one over and over. And, and if you do the severing correctly and you create the new neural pathway correctly, they'll want to, it's not, it's not, a challenge for them. And, and again, just, just to be clear that when you use the term neuropsychosurgery, uh, obviously we're not talking about anything invasive. We're talking about <laughs> the capacity of the mind to perform surgery on itself, especially in the presence of somebody who knows what you're doing and actually guiding the, 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 the process. Absolutely. That's right. So let's shift gears. This is just a, such a fascinating um, inroads and I'm interested that we take a bit of that awareness to ask you now to offer some commentary not just in in well about the what's happening on the world stage but not just in terms of the current this moment of crisis but in the broader sense because it appears that humanity is currently locked in some kind of a traumatic experience one that we have created over the entire historic trace and also one that was generated in more recent history and potentially the trauma we are actually creating in the moment of every day. And so if you look at the lens, through the lens of a human being at humanity at large, and you need to offer just a starter location and commentary about, about humanity's condition, what, what comes to mind? What, what are some of the first thoughts? Well, I think when we look at our current situation in the course of human history and, and developmental psychology, what we have is hunting and gathering societies were actually a very healthy way to grow up. You had a lot of intellectual stimulation. You had a lot of freedom. Uh, if anybody was abusive, you could leave them and find somebody else to take care of you. And, and so what happened was there was a lot of equality there's a lot of respect, there's a lot of appreciation, and anybody who was a bully just got abandoned. And if a community abandoned you, that was almost like a death sentence because living alone as a human being without claws and teeth is, I mean, the reason humans were so successful is their collective connection and they're working together. And so that's really hard to survive alone very long. I mean, you can do it, but it's not a great experience. So one of the biggest things that people that tribal peoples did was they just said you can't be part of our community and the people would live outside the community for six months or a year and people would sometimes give them scraps of food to survive and then they'd want to be back in and then they'd be more pro-social again so they didn't do any that was so anyway the bottom line is people learn not to be bullies people learn to be nice you know, and to respect each other and, and, and live just good lives. And so people's, uh, people's diets were in general, in most kids situations, really good. They had a huge diversity of, of food. They only worked about 15 hours a week to procure their necessary food. And the rest was spent in socialization, relaxation, and enjoying art and music and other diff different things that they love to do. Very different to uh, modern Western lifestyle where you need to work 40 or 50 or 60 or 80 hours a week. So very, very different. That's right. So imagine being raised in a whole community that has that much free time to play with its children, you know, and the children can come play and then leave and then go play with somebody else and leave and then play with somebody else and leave and everybody's safe in that community. That's a very rich way to grow up and live. And so I think the psychosocial development appeared to be pretty high when you look at the sophistication of some of the, um, uh, shamanic techniques that are out there. Uh, in my master's program, when I got through analyzing some of this stuff, I go, oh my gosh, modern psychotherapy is actually headed towards classic shamanism. And I predicted that in about 25 years, it would get close to where shamanism is. And it's actually 
taken that trajectory. So my master's thesis was a spot on um, prediction of what is actually happening. Modern psychotherapy is starting to catch up and it's doing some good stuff, but oh my gosh, what did we do in the meantime? How did we lose this beautiful stuff over the last thousands of years? And so what my current, my original theory was, is that when we had um, agrarian culture, uh, and that we ended up going through a shadow crash. Our diets crunched down to just a few foods. So our neuro, uh, our, our neuropsychological development wasn't as good. We know it's not as healthy of a diet to live on just wheat or grain than it is to live in a, in a the diverse hunting and gathering, diverse foraging uh, society. And, and we have to keep in mind that those diverse foraging societies weren't like the Kalahari desert people that we look at today. I mean, they were like in the Pacific Northwest where there were all kinds of foods all over the place. I mean, blackberries still grow there. You can't even eat enough of them, you know? There's, there, it's really rich. So um, we have to understand that hunting and gathering societies lived in all these rich environments as well. So anyway, our diet reduced, our brain size actually decreased some. And, um, and we started uh, living in, in um, um, warring uh, communities because there's a lot of warring because of the stored grains, you know? It doesn't, it isn't really effective to go to war against a hunter, hunter and gather society because there's nothing there. They eat the food that they got that day. So there's nothing to really grab. So there isn't a lot of uh, warring being done in, in a lot of ways. So, um, but once you store grain, a lot of warring can happen. So now we're not only in a restricted eating, a, a diet, which is not good for our brain, we're also living in constant uh, warring societies where raiders are trying to take your food grains and stuff. And so I think we went, went through a shadow crash. And when, let, let's just pause this. Um, let me just say this. We, we're tracing, and this was the, the main intent for our call today to trace the, the epochal journey of the project of mental health and whatever it is that we are exploring. We just got very excited with all the material you shared with us on the front end of the conversation, which is great. Uh, but we are now tracing, and the reason we are tracing that is because that's part of the, the, the portal's fascination with the epochal journey, and particularly with your help, the, the project of mental health. And the point you're making there is there was something that, that occurred with the rise of agrarian cultures and the shift away from hunter-gatherer tribal formations, and you just used the term shadow crash. What did you mean by that? Shadow crash is a term that I created that, that identifies that we move from a later developmental level to an early developmental level. Now, I'm not the only one that's come up with this idea. People talk about regression all the time. But I, I distinguish the term shadow crash because the regression isn't necessarily a nice, smooth process. Sometimes it's a crash. I actually drop from a fourth person perspective to a first person perspective or to a second person perspective. I'll give you an example. Maybe I'm walking along with life doing just fine. I bang my knee really hard and I fall in the fetal position. I'm just crying and I'm begging for help. I just went from fourth person perspective, rational thinking, good and everything to a first person perspective, fetal position, begging for help, you know, uh, and I might hold my fourth person perspective. Some people do, but for a moment, I might just completely be lost in the pain. And so, so that would be like a mini normal shadow crash that we have. A similar it happens psychologically for periods of time. Go ahead. A similar experience will take place when, um, uh, you live the peaceful life and you all of a sudden find yourself in a war, in a war zone. That's where, right. Where, where you need to essentially focus on one thing, which is survival. That's right. It can happen there. Now, some people will go there and get stuck there in trauma. And some people will drop there and then rise back up and use their later developmental capacities to manage that war situation. And both can still be traumatized too. It's very I'm interesting um, it from a later skill level. It's very interesting. The comment, what you just said now brings back to me an, an insight that was shared back in my days in, in the Air Force. They used to say that the people that thrive in, in peacetime training, you can never tell that they will be the, the steadiest, safest leaders in, in time of, uh, 
war and, and battle, and there, there would often be, this is why the, the term uh, peacetime generals and wartime generals came about, because there are, as you said, those that are able to, inside a stressful environment, step up to a, a point of clarity and, and management capacity that is highly operational, highly functional and empathetic and all of the above such that other people want to be around them and you couldn't always predict, often you couldn't predict who will these people be. That's right and this is a really interesting conversation too because the English uh, figured this out uh, I think a couple hundred years ago and so what they started doing is when they had uh, those before steam engines of still sailboats, right? And they had their big sailboat ships, but they discovered that um, that uh, the sailboats had crashed at sea, um, that they expected all the young, strong sailors to survive. But what happened was a lot of times it was the old sailors that survived and they were trying to figure out why this was. And they realized that uh, the, the young sailors didn't have the, the experience to under, not just the experience to survive, but the experience to even handle that kind of a traumatic situation where the old ones did. And so what they started doing was actually um, training their sailors on old ships out in the bay and, cr and crashing the ships and, and having them have to float there and survive and, and deal with that crisis situation and, and watch their leadership uh, capacities grow. And, and so uh, that was how they started determining who could really handle, not only could it develop the skills in all of them, but that also showed which people could really take on leadership roles in crisis situations. What we are now describing as the capacity to come back from what you called shadow crush, is this what we call resilience, the capacity to go up and down that, those stages of, of awareness and, and functionality? This is what a lot of people would call resilience, but I call it recovery. Resilience. Recovery. Resilience is the ability to stay there no matter the crash. And recovery is the ability that once you crash, how, how fast can you come back up? How far can you come back up? I like to distinguish that because it's really important in terms of working with people because they might have a lot of resiliency, but they might not be able to recover. Once that resiliency is broken, they're just down and they're down and out for six months or years or for the rest of their life. So we want to have more than resiliency. We want to have recovery. And that's one of the things that I do that, that I don't know if other psychotherapists do. That's one of the things that I discovered in my practice was that I needed to teach them recovery, not just resilience. And so what I would do is actually train them to, to notice the old neural pathway in action and then to shift it to the new neural pathway purposely on their own. So I would guide them back and forth between the old neural pathway and the new one so that they would build that crossover neural pathway. That's how you do the psychosurgery. And it's like creating a detour in a road. And that way they had that control just like that. So resiliency is good, but recovery is actually even more important in a lot of situations. So in that recovery process, you are observant, you're aware of the, the the other, we won't call it lesser, but the other behavior, and you're able to observe it and choose a different behavior, even while you're impacted by the um, um, side effects of that initial behavior. Yes, absolutely. Well, so uh, this was a, a curious detour, <laughs> but it's great. So we want to come back to the historic trace, and you, you're describing a little bit of what, what's occurring in that shadow crush. Uh, take us through the, the next steps. What happens later in what we describe generally as the ancient world in, in the Western Hemisphere or whatever it is that, that we, we know anywhere in the world really, uh, through what it was that people understood about health and mental health as, as we look through the arc of time? Okay, so just one little caveat as we go into that. As we move from agrarian society, as we move from hunting and gathering society to agrarian society, that's when sexism and classism were started. Most agrarian societies don't have sexism or classism. Most hunter-gatherer societies don't have. Sexism or classism. But it appears when, when we transition into agrarian societies? It appears when we transition into agrarian societies. And, and the, the, the socio-experiential context is what? 
set the capacity now. because we now aggregate, so now we appreciate power. The, the, the moment we have different levels of power, all the rest of it falls into place, all those pathologies. I think that's a, it's a good start on it. I think what happens is, is we start storing food. And then what happens is other people start rating us because look at all the food and all we have to do is rate it, right? So then we have to create defenses. So now we have to organize defenses and whoever's good at organizing those defenses starts taking leadership. And once they start taking leadership, then you have control over the food stuffs, you have control over the war, the empire, you know, the, the walls. And then if you start rating others, you know, the war leader starts becoming more and more, you know, looked up to because he knows how to break into the other stores. So you have leadership uh, things rising on both sides and you can't leave easily. If you're in an agrarian society and you leave, now you don't have the hunting and gathering skills anymore because you were raised there, right? And, and that's your group. You don't even know anybody outside. Whereas agrarian society, uh, hunting and gathering societies, like hunting and gathering societies across the United States, I could be on the Pacific, I could be in the Pacific coast and I could walk all the way to um, the middle, uh, all the way, almost all, all the way across America and just say, I'm part of the bear clan. And people would say, oh, you're part of the bear clan. Come on in. We don't know you, but we all kind of understand this dynamic and we'll welcome you in. And there was an understanding. So you could escape, you could leave and you could still be taken care of. Whereas in an agrarian society, you can't. And in a warring society, you can't, you'll get killed probably. And so uh, these hierarchies start developing. So there's your classism. And <clears throat> for some reason, sexism goes right along with that. You know, you got the control of the power over the weak. And since most males are stronger than most females, you had that, I think. I don't know for sure why the sexism had to come in in that way, but it did. And, and so that's where we see sexism and classism come in. And then we start seeing slavery come in. And I want to distinguish slavery from racism because slavery has been ubiquitous around the world on every continent, except for Antarctica. <laughs> um, uh, and, but it wasn't necessarily based upon race. They would, they, they, you know, race, uh, color of the skin didn't matter. They would enslave whoever. <laughs> so what happens, so, so what happens then and, and, when we reflect even outside of North America, as you said, some of the phenomen phenomenology you were describing appeared and emerged all around the planet. When, when we look um, back to the ancient world, to biblical times, what, what else do we know about the transition from agrarian societies to some of those classic axial age transitions? Yeah, so what we, what we have is this strange shadow crash that occurs in, in, in humanity on a psychological level. And then we start growing and we start building uh, large enough organizations that there's certain stability again. And I think the Axel age was where we got enough of that stability in some ways that um, people started really uh, investing in thought and the human condition a lot more again. And so we get I mean, technically Christianity isn't part of the Axel Age, but I think that's just because India was a couple hundred years ahead of uh, Europe at the time, maybe. So uh, I, I would call it all kind of the same thing. You know, we get these uh, Axel Age religions that arise and, um, and more ph philosophical thought starts arising and people start um, investing again in not just, you know, agricultural survival and things like that, but What's going on with our minds? What's going on with our feelings? What's going on with things like that? When we talk about the, the earlier tribal shamanic way of, of um, assistance, they did not, if I get that right, separate between the healing of the mind, the healing of the body, and the healing of the soul. These were three inseparable dimensions. So somewhere along the journey... And the healing of the community. And the healing of the community. Okay, so those four dimensions of healing are inseparable. Somewhere along the journey, we look at these and we, we call them by different names and they become different disciplines. When was that happening? Well, that's a good question, you know, because 
keep in mind there were hunters and gatherers. It depends upon where you're talking about in the world, right? We had hunters and gatherers. We still have hunters and gatherers. So when we come back to where does this start happening? I think there were people probably doing this all along that were kind of figuring this out. It's just how prominent it got pushed up in society. So let me give you a, uh, uh, an example. Like, well, actually, let me, I'm trying to cross correlate psychology with this at the same time. Okay. So when you take a look at first person perspective, early first person perspective, the Delta brain wave is dominant. And as we go through the perspectives, new brain wave, all the brain waves are there all the time, but a new brain wave becomes more, rises above the delta, and then another one rises above the alpha, and on and so forth. So what happens is, it appears that we have all of the, all of the different brainwave functions are, are there all along. It's just which one is rising to the surface. So I think you probably had, we had a lot of people that were probably thinking this way, carrying some of it on, but they didn't really catch the cultural, they didn't rise to the top of the cultural mind. Whereas, you know, once we got into the Axel age where we have uh, Buddha in India and we have what probably uh, Lao Tzu in China and I would say uh, uh, Socrates and Plato in, in Europe, um, we have a, a, a budding ex exploration of the mind. Oh, and Confucius also in um in China. Confucius, Lao Tzu is an interesting contrast there. Um, so all of these people all around the world are starting to rise and think about things in new ways. And it's amazing how many of them are thinking in fairly similar ways too, uh, although also in different ways in some way. But the process is moving along where people are starting to go, let's take a look at ourselves and our humanity here a little bit. What's going on? So you can see kind of what got lost into like a second person perspective in the agrarian age and a 2.5 in the, in the, in the, in the mythic uh, uh, agrarian age. Uh, at the Axel age, we're starting to get third person perspective rising back and prominent enough. And again, like I say, I think there were people all up and down the developmental spectrum all along, but enough people are feeling ready that they, they start paying attention to these people that are, in third person perspective and, and, and later. And, and, and these approaches and these activations, they express themselves with different modalities of mind. Some bring online the, the focus on prayer. Some in the East focus more on meditation. In some aspects in uh, the, the Platonic tradition and, and, and so on, the, there is the the, the work on virtues and, and so on, but they are all looking and introspecting who am I, what is the larger theater that, that I'm operating in, and th they are experimenting with new theories of mind, new practices of mind, and at these stages, do we have a definition of something that's called mental health, or this is simply totally integrated to living a virtuous life, there is no difference and, and distinction between the two, or we do have the, some definition of what mental health is, and, and uh, the, or that is something that, that appears later as a, as a project of mental health. W where do you place that? That's a really good question, and what we want to be really careful here is not crossing individual development and cultural development in a way that becomes... Um, racist or or culturalist cultural centric or something like mm -hmm. that so i just want to separate that out for a little bit and so i'm saying that we probably had multiple developmental levels of people just like we do today we have people in first person perspective and fifth fourth person perspective and on up and they probably did all the way back through there too it's just so who, who was pay, being paid attention to where was the larger society rising? And in, in hunting and gathering societies, probably the, the average was pretty high. In agrarian societies, it was probably, early agrarian societies, it was probably fairly low. And then it rose again in the Axel age so that we could start thinking like this again. Now, here's the devil in the details. If you take a look at um, like um, 
Emperor Han's Orthodox Classic. This is a 3,000 year old Chinese text where the physicians of the day could separate out physical health, mental health, and they were exploring how to treat mental health. And some of their treatments are valid even today. They're what we're starting to rediscover in the 19th and the 20th century. And so they actually had it figured out. And like I said, the shamans did before them. So not all of it was lost. Some of it was carried through. It's just that some of it got so buried that it may, a lot of it did get lost, but some of it got retained. And so in India, we have, what's the, I forget the name of the text in India, but we have examples of Indian texts that are about almost 3000 years old too, that also uh, um, in, in the Ayurvedic uh, tradition that are separating out uh, or uh, integrating um, the understanding mental health issues, but understanding how it affects the physical and how the physical body affects mental health, same in, in the Han dynasty. And we're seeing that also um, in Egypt. In Egypt, we have examples of, of understanding mental health issues and how to treat mental health issues. And some of them include um, dream interpretation, which is one of the things that Freud got uh, all his accolades for, you know, just a hundred years, 150 years ago, you know, as being pinnacle edge, leading edge. And, and the Egyptians were doing similar things and seeing it in similar ways, not, not exactly similar, but similar enough that um, that, uh, that was 3000 years ago or older, older than that. In some of these schools of thoughts that are pursuing and developing purification techniques and uh, peak experiences. And I'm, I'm curious that this idea that the search for peak experience and ultimate optimal or ultimate functionality and the search for healing, they, they often live very close one next to the other. Give us a comment on the, the relationality of these two dimensions of experience. Yeah, I think that's really brilliant. You know, you'll notice that children will try to get altered states of consciousness just by spinning around in circles. Right. right. So, you know, uh, there's something about the human mind that just uh, we get an ordinary state of mind and then we love to have something new. We create an, uh, an extraordinary state of mind. And then teenagers start doing it by using drugs and alcohol and, and different things like that, chemical ways of doing it. And then a lot of times, um, what we see is people starting to do meditations and prayers and things like that um, up in the subtlety or more. Uh, the more concrete ways of, of getting altered states starts fading and the new, then the more subtle ways start rising to prominence. How do I do it through meditation? How do I do it directly with my mind, not through material methods of, of substances and, and activities and stuff? Um, not, not that those are necessarily thrown out. It's just that the others rise in prominence. So we might still get, uh, peak experiences by climbing a mountain or, but this and is really, is, is, is part of this, the, the intuitive knowledge of, of the body of the brain that, that, that there is in those states enhanced plasticity. And so there, there may be a way to reroute my perspective and my experience. And, and is that also the, potentially the link between peak experiences and, and healing? Or am I? I think you're right on, Aviv. I think that that's what's going on is that, that um, many human minds are not happy with complacency. You get something, it's stable, and it seems like so many of us just need to do something else then to, to challenge the system, to challenge the mental system. And so we go into different state experiences. And sometimes we do that by uh, spinning. Sometimes we do it by drugs and alcohol. Sometimes people do it by having an affair in a marriage. You know, the marriage gets stale, they call it. Well, no, it's just stable. You can't handle stability. No, I got to have something new, right? You know, it's like, okay, this is the brain wanting to create something new. And, and you don't necessarily have to do it through an affair, by the way. So I'm people, I'm not saying to do that. <laughs> I'm just saying, if we understand how our mind works, it doesn't have to be done that way. We can start exploring how our mind can have freshness in everyday experiences 
And that way we keep pushing the state experience and we start to keep our neuroplasticity going. And that helps us to stay healthy and strong. So this is a beautiful segue to, to make this huge leap because you, we describe a great, well, hunter-gatherer societies, the agrarian revolution coming through the axial age and, and the exploration there. But then we enter this long period that we call the Middle Ages, Dark Ages, Middle Ages, all the way, and I'm, I'm moving swiftly here to what begins to occur with the first rise of universities in the 10th and the 11th century in, in, in Europe, and all the way swiftly, quickly, swiftly through time to the, well, to the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. So what would you offer by way of commentary, either from the knowledge of that period or by way of looking at it through the lens of the developmental journey of, <clears throat> of what occurs there. Because one way to describe that fascination of the brain that you are now describing is, is what begins to occur through the Renaissance and in the way on that journey to, to the Enlightenment. How, how would you, and again, we are tracing the project of mental health and the appreciation, the theory of mind, and, and those practices um, through those ages. What would you offer as, as a commentary for those periods? Yeah, so first of all, just to acknowledge the wavy line of, of progression and regression in through there. And this seems to be pretty accurate throughout most of the world. I don't know about North and South America for sure, but in certainly in India, China, and uh, Europe, uh, what we see is a strange decline again for a little bit in the middle age period and then a rise again. And so even though they had a little more wisdom during the classical period, and, and even though we have universities and we're making progress in some ways, we're seeing a little bit of dip just before that. Um, well, we're seeing a dip after the, like after the end of the classical period, after the, the Roman empire crashes and um, after the, uh, I, I'm assuming it's after the Han, Han Dynasty, but I'm not sure. Um, we're seeing kind of a little bit of crash before it recovers again. I think what we had is we, we had these large uh, dynasties, you know, the Roman Empire that created, even though there was war going on, there was general stability within it during the Greeks. And, you know, there was, there was enough strength and stability to allow for a lot of thought to go on. And then there was some instability for a while. And I think instability tends to make us uh, drop down and not take so much perspective on ourselves. So then as it starts stabilizing again a little bit, we get more, uh, more thought around this again, but what, what's happening is we're seeing that they're almost rebuilding what was lost. So for example, if you even just take a look at like Plato's allegory of the cave, you know, that, that pretty much is, is, uh, the, um, like Freud and Jung on steroids almost. It's like, it's, <laughs> it's like way more sophisticated really in a lot of ways than even what Jung and Freud were saying, although not as detailed in terms of the actual exploration of the mind, but in terms of a philosophical understanding, it's pretty advanced. You know, he's really saying that um, our perceptions are shaped by culture and, and we can't step out of it. And not only is it shaped by the culture and the way we were raised, but it is, we are limited by our senses themselves. We cannot know reality, no matter what we do, no matter how much we dive in, no matter how much shadow work we do. Basically, I would hear Plato say, you're never going to know it because our senses cannot perceive everything we need to perceive to get reality accurate. It, we're limited. So from that point of view, you're saying that we are simply still recovering what we forgot that we knew all the way through to the even the 18, 19 and, and early 20th century. In, in some ways. Way. In some ways. But we're filling it out in more detail. So instead of seeing it as a height growth, in a lot of ways, we're getting more breadth, we're getting more details, we're filling in more details too. So we kind of crashed, 
But then as we came up, we started filling in more details about it as we came up. So when we take a look at Freud and Jung, they're not any more philosophically sophisticated than Plato, but they have a lot more detail around what are they talking about in terms of the, the mental psyche on a breadth level. When we look at the, what you describe as, as the rise and the fall and the rise and the fall and, and, and the crash and, and, and the recovery, if, if we look at it through uh, GDP and, and economics and, and, and such, we, we simply would say that these were cycles that occurred because of the, the reduced quality of life. If we become philosophical or spiritual or evolutionarily spiritual about it, we, we could also propose that every time there is a regressive cycle, there is a potential relearning process and we potentially are retracing certain aspects of the journey to um, rejoin or, or, or get um, rediscover whatever it is that we need to discover with new know-how having potentially worked out some of the bugs in the system and, and I'm, I'm wondering if that's a useful narrative in the way we are looking to trace what occurs as we come through the Industrial Revolution, through the um, those the, the 19th century into the the 20th century, and and through two world wars, because so much of where we started this conversation relates to you essentially saying, I count on anybody studying psychotherapy to having taken some kind of a, an interest in developmental frameworks. So somewhere along the journey, developmental frameworks and systems appear on the horizon. I don't know where you'd say that, uh, early 19th century through, but mostly into the 20th century. And it seems to me that that is part of the way to tell at a high level the story of the, the journey and what's emerging that is really setting the stage for the, the last six, seven decades of developmental uh, processing and, and uh, where so much of what we started the conversation with comes online. What, yeah, what I, love, I love what you're saying there. And what that, what that brings up for me is, is how um, we have cultural and individual dynamics that are mimic each other all the time. So as I was talking earlier about the importance of resilience, but also the importance of recovery, the same is true of cultures. We want to have resilient culture because that allows for the stability that allows us to develop all this stuff. But we also need to have recovery because there's gonna be crashes, so how do we recover? And one of the fortunate things we have now that they didn't have back then is we have, um, we have like a lot more data that's stored. And so um, uh, when they did invent writing, you know, at least that data was stored in writing and, and people could Reaccess it if they could find the books, if, the, if it wasn't burnt or it wasn't lost somehow. But it was harder to find it and it wasn't ubiquitously accessible to people. Now we have data that's ubiquitously accessible to everybody. So any information that is lost by one part of the world or culture, that, that culture can reaccess it and use that for, re for recovery to enhance their recovery. Unless we have a, a worldwide system shutdown that where we lose all our electronic data, in which case now we're back to a bit of a, of a difficulty. We'll be back to the books that have been written in hard copy, but so much of the new information we have is not even printed. It's all digital. So every new technology that comes online unlocks new possibility of development and and evolution and at the same time potentially brings into the, the the theater of life a new shadow because so the invention of print the invention of all those inventions that, that unlock essentially the the scientific revolution and now 400 years uh, uh, later we're still needing to deal and reintegrate some of the cartesian breakdown of separating ourselves to be totally based on everything that's empiric and objective. Not that we do not want the empiric and the objective. We love the, what that methodology brought to us, but so much of what you were describing in the first place, and especially when you're describing 
where the healing of the mind, the healing of the body, the healing of the soul, and the healing of the community were inseparable, where you can't really have those objective and subjective dimensions of your life being separated. They need to somehow be reintegrated in, in what life is all about. Yeah, it's a systems thinking process, which, by the way, is uh, this type of systems thinking process is at least 4.5, late fourth person perspective, almost a fifth person perspective. And we see that in shamanism. That's why we know that they had people, at least people that were quite late in their development, because that's fairly rare. I mean, Terry and Terry's done a lot of research about how many people are at these later stages. And 4.5 is like the way on the descending end of the bell curve of how many people uh, in the world are actually operating at that level. Most people are probably around 2.5, 3.0, maybe 3.5. That's kind of the peak of the bell curve. So by the time you're at fourth person perspective, early fourth person perspective, you're getting down there to a little more of a rare contingency. There's quite a few people, but by the time you get to 4.5, it's getting very rare. And yet we see the systems thinking in shamanic healing techniques and strategies and how they do it. And so, yes, we're integrating cognition, emotion, um, uh, spirituality, and culture and society culture all at the same time. I can't heal the individual without healing the society. As soon as I heal the individual, I'm healing the society <laughs> I have to heal the society to heal the individual too. So the strategies are all around how do I arrange the subconscious and conscious symbolic elements in the individual and the culture in a way that leads to a whole healing for the individual and the society simultaneously. And you know what? Most psychology isn't even close to thinking like that. And for people that stayed with us to this point of the conversation, we didn't do a formal grounding in the stages uh, models. So when you speak about 2.5 and, and 4.5, these are different stages you, you articulate in, in the stages model. So, so we've gone kind of a supersonic speed through the, the history of time in, in this, uh, these last uh, few minutes, really to set the stage for uh, perhaps a, a part two where we can look in, in a deeper way, put a magnifying glass on what, what occurs in the last several decades and where are we as as the human of the humanity that we are the human person that that symbolizes humanity and what what are some of the tensions and, and the polarities that you just articulated there that, that we need to learn to to integrate if we are to produce a, um, a healthier kind of world for ourselves and and for our children and Part of the premise of approaching this part two of the conversation will be that because we have developed such catastrophic self-destructive powers, unless we can actually heal ourselves and heal society at large, we are on a very dangerous trajectory. So, so the, the, the powerful, urgent project of internalizing and deeply reflecting on these developmental trajectories and what they, repre what they represent and putting in context the, the kind of healing process that must be integrated into, into that, all that is central to the project of, of the rest of the century. If we have that century, if, if we didn't blow this place up and we cannot but be optimistic because we have children and grandchildren to look after, so we're taking that moral position. But so what I'm asking is what would you, what else would you offer by way of bringing us to, to a, a pause at, at the end of this conversation by way of, way of commentary on the journey from the to early 20th century to the mid 20th century where we will pick up again the, the developmental story. What, what else would you offer by way of location such that we can rest there until we pick up part two of the conversation? Well, one of the things we can do is take a look at how, even though the ancient traditions had ideas for mental health um, and, and mind-body healing even, the storylines around them are different. And one of the things that came to prominence uh, with Freud was the storyline of, of mental health being a scientific 
uh, secular scientific endeavor? And how do we really look at it from a scientific objective perspective? Um, and that was a, a, an important thing to add, even though I, I think a lot of the ancient traditions, they had the information, but I don't know how, how much of it was really studied from a scientific perspective. I think a lot of it was trial and error. They were observative. They would explore and observe. But now we're going to move into an era of, okay, now we're going to scientifically study this as a community. And when that happens, we get warp speed growth. And while we, I don't think we've caught up to shamanism yet, we do see warp speed growth in mental health once we took that step to move towards scientific study of the mind and of mental health. Part of the argument between Freud and Jung was that, that Freud wanted Jung to make sure that he stayed completely on the scientific side of the street, but Jung was very interested to pursue these other avenues, other frontiers of discovery, in, in, including um, the, the unconscious and spirituality and, and, and other cultures and, and, and so on. So he was obviously intuiting that these needed to be reintegrated in some way. And I think he was right. And that's the, that's the weird, strange mix is that the, the science, by separating things out, by dissecting it, they learn more details. And by integrating, we live a more whole life. So we want to live a whole life, but that breadth that we're talking about, that comes by dissecting things and taking them apart. But that would also mean looking at spirituality, looking at uh, emotional progresses, looking at cognitive ones, looking at societal ones, you know, whereas, you know, our, our, um, our scientific revolution led to a, a splintering of the discipline, so to speak, so that everything had its own discipline. But and that allowed for an amazing amount of detail, though. Look how much detailed information we have, right? And it's way more than, than uh, I would say, any, any time in human, human history by far. We have so much more detail than ever before. Now our challenge is how do we integrate all this detail in a skillful way? That's challenge one. And challenge two is how do you introduce world leaders to these processes so, they can, so, so that they can get on with the program? <laughs> how do you even get the world leaders to care? That's the first step. <laughs> well, uh, Kim, this has been a, 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 a deliciously rich uh, trace. And um, the, the power of applying the practical experience and know-how and diagnostic and therapeutic modalities and looking through these lens at the human condition broadly and, and the, the epochal trace of humanity is a, is a great fascination for us. So uh, thank you very much. Any parting words um, uh, that you want to share? It was just an honor being here with you, Aviv. I really enjoyed our conversation and I look forward to another one. <laughs>